Stand with us if you would this morning. 512 in your songbook or the words are on the screen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. You sing it with us this morning. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. with us again. Y'all were with us last time. Y'all were sitting over there. Don't confuse me like that. It doesn't take much to confuse me. We're so glad to have you back with us today. Thank you so much. All right, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Man, I wish it were today, don't you? I'm about tired of all this stuff. I wish it come before this election. Dear Lord in heaven, it's going to be a long, hot summer. I'm sure the world. Here we go. Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many of us in here this morning are, are, maybe you have that attitude, or you have someone in your life who something goes wrong, something goes awry, something bad happens, and they'll say these words to you, oh, it could have been worse. Anybody have anybody like that? That's actually a good attitude to have. The Bible teaches that. The Bible teaches that we ought to always give thanks in everything. You know what that word everything means? In everything, good, bad, indifferent, doesn't matter. Uh, I firmly believe that God causes or allows everything in our life to happen. He either causes it directly or he allows it to happen. But he always does it for our good. And, and you know, I've been in that situation, you've been in that situation before where something bad happened and you think to yourself, how could this be good for me? Well, you dig deep enough into God's Word, you get close enough to Him in prayer, and He'll show you why that situation's come into your life and what you can learn from it. 
But after all of that, the Bible also teaches that we need to give him thanks for that. Give him thanks for being involved in our life, for trying to grow us and mature us and draw us closer to him. So as we sing that song, I hope you'll think about the fact that we probably don't give thanks often enough. We ought to be doing that more. I hope this song will encourage you. Stand with us one last time, if you would. We'll let our choir go down. Our ushers come in and take today's offering. Oh, how I love Jesus. You sing with us this morning. There is a name I love to hear. And I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Sing the last. It tells of what whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus 
soul how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Morning, guys. How are y'all? Good? Everybody's doing well? Wonderful. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to our church. How you work through the hearts and lives of these people all these years. They've trusted you. And God, you've been faithful, and for that we're grateful. Bless the offering today now in Christ's name. Amen. Father, we want to pause long enough to thank you, Lord, for what you gave this morning, how you work through the people's hearts and lives. And I just pray, Lord, that you would bless them in a very special way for their faithfulness to you. In Christ's name, amen. If you read throughout Scripture, you'll find in numerous places in the Bible where it talks about the fact that we ought to come together as a group and to worship. And a lot of people come together in groups. There's, there's churches meeting all over the world today. But they miss the boat on this one thing. We're here to worship the king. We're not here to worship a man. Um, our king is not just a good guy, a good old boy. Uh, you know, many religions think that he was just a famous prophet. No, he wasn't. He was the king of, the, of, of, of all eternity, the savior of the world. He's going to come back one day and prove that. And so this song talks about the fact that he is our king. And when we come together, we need to worship him as king. There is no one above Christ and God on the scale that we need to come and worship. You listen to the words. Lord, here I am again, coming into your presence with a song of praise and a heart that is grateful and searching for ways to tell you I'm thankful for all that you are to me. When my soul is troubled, you are my peace. When I am weak, you are my strength. When others forsake me, you are my friend. When battles keep raging, you're my defense. When my heart is broken, you are my healer. When I need it saving, you were my Savior when I come to worship, whenever I sing, you are my King. Sometimes I stop and I think just where I would be if your hand of mercy had not rescued me, you give grace undeserved, non failing love. You're always just what I need. When my soul is troubled, you are my peace. When I am weak, you are my strength. When others forsake me, you are my friend. When battles keep raging, you're my defense. When my heart is broken, you are my healer. When I needed saving, you were my savior. When I come to worship, whenever I sing, you are my king. Amazing, loving, unchanging. What you've been to others is what you are to me. 
and always will be. You are my friend. You are my healer. When I needed saving, you were my Savior. When I come to worship, whenever I sing, you are my King. I come to worship whenever I sing. You are my King. Lord, you are my King. We have a little saying that we've learned around here. It goes like this, ain't nobody like him. And that's the truth. If you have your Bibles, I hope that you'll uh, open up God's Word to Hebrews chapter number 11. Last week, I began just a three or four little series of messages on faith and the importance of faith in the life of believers. I'll be real honest with you this morning. I've got more message then I probably have time but uh, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do with what we got I, th I, I just want you to get a handle on what it means what faith truly means how important faith is so I don't mean to be so repetitive or on some things but I just I, I, I want you to I want you to get it uh, so I hope that you'll understand it. But let's read, uh, let's read the first two or three verses here and then uh, look at verse number seven. I want to speak to you for a few minutes on the work of faith. And when I talk about the work of faith, we're talking about the life of Noah. I thought it was very appropriate speaking on Noah this week. I didn't plan it that way. I didn't even think about it. Uh, this group that we had this week that we went to see the ark up in Kentucky. And uh, it was an, a really a, an amazing uh, thing to behold. I would, I would certainly encourage all of you to, if you ever get an opportunity, to go see the ark. You realize when you view that ark of the possibility, because a lot of people say, oh, I, just, I don't even see that that's possible to be able to keep all those animals and all that stuff. But it is. It truly is, okay? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Again, I ask you, if you mark in your Bible, uh, to underline the word substance. And that word literally means the assurance or the confidence is what he's talking about. So faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The word evidence there could also be uh, conviction, the conviction of the, of, the, of the fact of things not seen, that you will see them. For by it, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Look, if you would, at verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saying of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. If you don't have a handle on faith, you're going to have a hard time in your Christian walk and in your Christian life. Uh, let's pray and then I'll, I'll ask you a question. Father, I'd sure like to make this simple. And Lord, there's not but one way that we're ever going to be pleasing to you, and that is if we live our life by faith. And it's easy for me to say, but it sure is a boatload of uh, challenges in our lives to live by faith day in and day out as Christians, especially in the times in which we live. So, Father, I pray you'll help me to 
make it about as simple as I know to make it, and you speak to people's hearts, and I'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. I opened up basically last week's message by asking this simple question. If you care a great deal about someone, it just seems to make sense that you want to do for that someone the things that would please them or make them happy. Okay? Uh, Van, how long have y'all been married? Let me, let me forget that, okay? Frankie, how long have y'all been married? 57 years. So in 57 years, and there's no doubt in my mind that you have learned in those years the things that makes him happy. And because you do love him, you've done the things that would make him happy. I'll use this analogy, this illustration, okay? Let's say, for instance, that Van, Van Britt, has got a favorite meal, okay, whatever it may be. And, uh, uh, and Frankie knows what his favorite meal is. And because she loves him, she's going to, at times, not all the time, but there's going to be times that she's going to do all within her power because she loves him to make that meal for him, to, be a, to demonstrate, I love you. I'm making this for you. You know, you know, it's not, I mean, after 57 years of marriage, you got to come up with some kind of idea to, to tell somebody you love them other than just, you know, I love you. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. I'm really digging this hole fast. Uh, but anyhow, you understand my point. Well, here's, here's my point. If you look at verse 6, chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. In other words, if Frankie had a heart's desire because of her love for Van to please Van, Frankie's going to bake whatever it is or do whatever it is in order to please him. The Bible says in the same analogy, in the same thinking, if I have a heart's desire to be pleasing to my Savior for who he is and for what he's done for me, I'm going to do everything within my power to live my life by faith. Because verse 6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. So I'm going to do everything. And that's the reason I came up with this little series about faith. We have looked, uh, last time we looked at uh, Abel, the life of Abel. And Abel exercised faith, okay? In order to be pleasing to the Lord, he exercised faith. If we took time to look at Enoch, Enoch's life had a fellowship of faith. Enoch walked with God. As a matter of fact, Enoch walked right on in the glory. He didn't ever die. He just, God just took him on. So, uh, there, there's different ways of faith. So I want to look today. Noah had a heart's desire to be pleasing to the Lord. And Noah knew in his life and in his lifetime, if I'm going to please God, then I'm going to have to work the work of faith in order to please God. Now listen to me, guys. All these things that I'm talking about, are the same things that you, you can't pick and choose what you want to do, okay? In other words, when, when we talk about Abel, there was an exercise of faith. You and I need to learn to exercise faith. We need to fellowship, have the fellowship of faith with the Lord. We need to work for the Lord. We're going to see in the life of Joseph. Also, Joseph, you know, uh, he, he demonstrated faith. So there's a lot of ways uh, he was persistent in his faith. All of these acts of faith is what's going to be pleasing to the Lord. Now, we'll go back in just a few minutes to the book of Genesis. You find the life and the story of Noah in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. And we'll go back primarily to chapter 6 in just, in just a few minutes. But as believers, it's not only our privilege to fellowship with God and to walk in fellowship with Him, 
but also to be co-workers with God. Now, let me explain what I mean. That's what Noah was. Noah pleased God by the work that he did for God. And if you and I are going to be pleasing to God by faith, then we have to be co-workers with God. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. The only way I know to do this is to, is to look at scripture, okay? So go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 for just a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 1. We then, as workers together with him, meaning with God, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Great verse as far as working with God. Look at it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then, Paul was talking about, he's talking about the, the people at Corinth, workers together with him, referring to God, beseech you, meaning I beg you, that also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. The grace of God means the favor of God. In other words, when you get saved and you get saved by the grace of God, you don't receive the grace of God just to enjoy the grace of God for yourself. You receive the grace of God that you in turn might be co-workers with God in order to do what God's called you to do. You don't just sit on your blessed constitution. You don't just come in here and sit down and do squat. You find your place to work for God. This, is, this, this place is not just about I'm thrilled that you're here. And I am thrilled that you're here. But everybody ought to have a place to serve God in some capacity. You say, well, I, 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 I don't know what I could do. You can sing in the choir. I can't care a tune in the bucket. We, we supply the buckets. <laughs> Terry's never turned anybody down that's gone to that choir, ever. Never turned anybody down. Don't plan on it, okay? It's not about you sing well. It's about who you sing for right. and why you sing what you sing. Let me give you another verse to go along with this work. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, very familiar verse. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. The Bible says, for we are his workmanship. We're still talking about working for the Lord in order to be pleasing to the Lord. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God saved you, God ordained you, God set you apart that you might walk in his good works, okay? That's what God has called us to do. It's vitally important that we understand that. So scripture clearly teaches that, that wherever there is true faith in God, there's always an outward evidence of that faith. Let me give you a script. You don't have to turn there, but it says in the book of James, James chapter 2, verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. You say, I got faith. I, I, I believe, preacher, what you say, that for by grace are you saved through faith. I got faith. Well, everybody's got faith of some sort, but you've either got a living faith or dead faith. You got faith. But if your faith does not transform your life, there's something missing in the faith that you say that you have. Okay? It's important that we understand that. So it's useless to say we have faith in God and His Word, and there's no works in our lives to demonstrate our faith. Noah had faith which made him well-pleasing to the Lord and which was seen in the amazing work that he did in building this ark. In other words, is everybody going out of here this morning for a particular reason? Is there something going on in the hallway? I don't understand for the life of me why well, everybody gets up and walks out. If you got a little bladder, go before you go to church. Have mercy, you know. That ought to sit well with some parents, okay? That's okay. Anyhow, Noah had faith, which made him pleasing to the Lord, okay? 
And Noah must have been faithful to work. I, I thought about this. Did God choose Noah because he was a good shipbuilder? No. Nobody had ever built a ship. I think God chose Noah because Noah was faithful before the ark was ever started. Okay? And I think he chose Noah that way. And so, you know, in proclaiming God's word, Noah proclaimed the word of God for 120 years. His obedience to the word of God. So God chose Noah to do what Noah did. So, before we consider the life of Noah and how faith works in a believer's life, let's see three reasons why I think the study of Noah's life is so up to date in the times in which we live. I thought about this. I, I thought about if Noah were alive today and God had impressed on Noah to do something, would Noah do today what he did then and I and I and I thought about you and I if God leads us to do something in our hearts and lives is 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 is, is God going to ask you to do something that that maybe you feel like that you're not capable of doing I have no no qualms about the fact that Noah thought dear Lord an ark and he started telling him how big he wanted it to be, and, and the list kind of goes on and on. But let me give you three things. First of all, Noah lived in the day of grace, and so do we. Okay? In other words, in Noah's case, the door was wide open for people to embrace the grace of God for 120 years. The Bible talks about how Noah preached the truth of the grace of God for 120 years. And I think also that we live in a day of grace when God offers salvation to any and all who will accept the grace of God. Look again at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 for just a minute. I want you to look, and this is an important verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, but look at verse 2. The Bible, Paul says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. That word supported thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You say, preacher, why is that so important? Paul says, now is the time of the day of getting saved. Now it is. I'm talking about the same thing that went on in Noah's day. It's the same thing that goes on in our day, okay? Now is the time of salvation. You say, why is that important? Because there's going to come a day when salvation will not be available. Right. There's going to come a time in the mind of God, and listen carefully what I'm getting ready to say. There's going to come a time in your life, my life has already been settled as far as my salvation. I don't know about any of you. I'd like to know. I don't know about you. I don't know your heart, okay? So there's going to come a day in your life when the Spirit of God will no longer convict you of your need for Jesus Christ. So if you sit there Sunday after Sunday, week after week, month after month, and you hear the truth of the gospel, you hear about faith, and you say, well, I must have a dead faith because I got no desire to do anything for God. All I want to do is to show up for church, let that preacher get up and holler for a few minutes, and I'll leave, and I've satisfied my religious obligation. If that's true in your life and God makes no difference in your life, you're going to bust hell wide open. You don't come in contact with God and remain the same. The Bible says we are conformed. There is a transformation that takes place in our lives. Things change. Something ought to change in our life. I'm not saying you got to be a Billy Bible. I'm not saying you got to be a missionary. I'm not saying you got to be a preacher, though there's a lot of preachers that's not going to go. But anyhow, I'm not saying you have to be all that. But I am saying there ought to be some transformation goes on in your mind, and then it gets in your heart, and before long it gets in your feet. And God begins to change people. Everybody's different, and I understand that. 
So there is a time. Let me read that verse again. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Because there's going to come a time when that day will be no more. Let me give you one other verse. Go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 3. Look at verses 7 and 8. Hebrews 3 verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in provocation. That word provocation there means to make, uh, to make someone angry, okay? Harden, this is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8. Harden not your heart as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now, let me explain what he's talking about there because he's writing to Jewish people. Jewish people would have been very familiar with, with the writer of Hebrews because he was writing primarily to Jewish people. And these readers, they knew the story of the rebellion of the Israelites as they went through the promised land. If you read the Old Testament, it's all about the Israelites turning their back on God. Their hearts hardening. They were turning to Baal. They were turning to the, to the idols of that day and such, such as that. And God in his grace and God in his mercy kept coming back to them, making a way for them to get saved. But they kept turning away from him. That's exactly what he's trying to say there. And that's exactly what I'm trying to say to you this morning. There's a time in your life when you cross that line. You can't get back. I don't know when that is in your life. I don't think it's the same for everybody. But I believe with all of my being that there is a time you cross God's deadline. And you can't get back. Because the Spirit of God will withdraw himself from you. So number one, Noah lived in a day of grace, just as we do. Number two, Noah lived and worked in a day of terrible apostasy. And so do we. Go back to Genesis, if you would, please. Genesis chapter number six. Look, if you would, at verse one. Genesis chapter six and verse one. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now let me, I, I, you know, there's a, there's a debate about who that is in verse number two. A lot of good men differ on the interpretation. Personally, I lean towards those being fallen angels who take up residence on earth to produce children. There's a verse I know in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, and I believe verse number 30, that talks about angels that don't marry, but it doesn't mean that they can't produce children. Okay, but anyhow, that's another thing. But let's read on. Verse 2, Genesis 6, 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of, of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Look at verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, and were of old men of renown. Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth. And that every imagination of thoughts. You ought to underline that or put in parentheses. Now this is prior, just prior to the flood. Verse 5 again. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's an unbelievable statement. Verse 6. 
And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. The word repented there, it means that literally it means to grieve the heart of God because of the choices that men are making. God gave men a free will to choose. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things, and the fowl of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. Now, sin, and it's important we get this, sin begins in the, in the thought process of man. That's the reason he said what he said in verse number 5. Every imagination of the thought, okay? That's where their, their, their mind was exceedingly wicked. I mean, from the inside out. And if you'll notice in verse 7, don't miss this, God does have a time when his patience does run out. He did then, and I believe with all of my heart that he does today. There will come a time that God's patience with individuals will run out. And God will withdraw himself from that individual as far as coming to know Christ as Savior. So, just as Noah lived and labored for the Lord in a time of great spiritual and moral darkness and wickedness, so do we. We live in a time when, when right is wrong and wrong is right and man doesn't know if he's a man or a woman. We're living in some confusing times. If I'm not mistaken, where's my wife at? Right there. Didn't you say that the uh, Miss America or Miss something... Miss Marilyn was a transgender. Is that Miss America contest? Some contest in Maryland. A transgender won it. Now, if that's not confusing, there's a problem somewhere. If the judges can't tell that that's a man, they need to get a little bit closer. Okay? That's the times in which we live, and that's the times in which Noah also lived. So Noah lived in a day of grace. Secondly, Noah lived and worked in a day of terrible apostasy, and so do we. Apostasy means to get away from the things of God and the truth of God and such as that. And then number three, Noah lived and worked at the end of an age or a dispensation. What I mean by that is this. Noah lived in a time or dispensation called antediluvium. And that means before the flood, okay? Everything that took place before the flood. So we live in the last days of the dispensation of grace, just like Noah did, okay? There is coming a time, and guys, I, I know I keep beating this drum, but there's going to come a time when there's not going to be any more grace available. Go in your Bibles. Turn with me to uh, keep your finger in Genesis but go back for just a minute to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. Look, if you would, at verse number 37, I believe it is. Matthew 24. Look at verse 37. But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it uh, also in the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You say, what's that mean, preacher? It just simply means that in the days of Noah, they were ignoring the, the truth and the preaching of what Noah was saying. And you know what's going on in our day and time? People are ignoring the truth of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ today. They look at you and I, well, let me rephrase that. They look at me as some sort of a right-wing dingbat that I spend every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, trying to stand behind this pulpit and tell people about the grace of God. And they think that we're just blooming idiots. 
is exactly what they think. And that's exactly what, what uh, the writer Christ was talking about there in Matthew 24. So Noah lived in a world which was under the, the condemnation, and so do we. Now, let's look at Noah and see how faith works. What, you know, what is the work of faith? And I'll, I'll give you a couple of things. I won't be able to get through all this, but we'll look at a couple of them. Two or three things about the work of faith. Number one, the work of faith is to hear the voice of God in the midst of all the noise and the voices of the world. Let me say that again. The work of faith is to hear the voice of God in the midst of all the noise and the voices of the world. You know, truth is, I, I don't know if people put themselves in places where they can hear the Lord speak or not. You ever, my wife has a, an issue hearing. Most of y'all don't know that she wears hearing aids. She wears them to where you, you can't even hear them, I mean, you can't see them. But she can get in a particular situation where there are a lot of people and if those people in that room are talking, she can't pick up on what someone is saying. She just, uh, it's just, you know, it's just a bunch of, and maybe some of y'all are, are the same way, I don't know. But we live in a time, you know, when we are surrounded by so many confusing voices. Even religious voices sometimes can get confusing because they don't all agree. And the work of faith is to catch God's voice amid all of the other voices and all uh, uh, in the midst of all of the noise of the world and what's going on to be able to pick up the voice of God. And I believe that, that oftentimes you need to be listening on purpose to hear what he has to say. Let me give you an illustration. Go back, if you would, or wherever you are in your Bible, go to 1 Kings chapter 19 for just a minute. It's a familiar story, 1 Kings 19. Elijah is the main character here. Elijah was in a season or a time of real discouragement in his life. As a matter of fact, Elijah had come to the place where you know, he, he didn't care if his life ended. We wonder sometimes how in the world could a man of God like Elijah get to the place where he didn't care if his life ended. Well, he was under so much pressure during those particular days. Uh, he had Jezebel was after him. He had just killed all of her preachers, all of her prophets, and he had taken off running. And uh, she had promised, she said, I'll kill you graveyard dead before tomorrow. And he was, he was having a real hard time. And God was trying to encourage him. But if you look at 1 Kings 19, let's begin with verse 8. And it says, And he rose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Verse 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with a sword, and I, even I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. In other words, he said, God, don't you understand where I am? I'm in a mess. I, I stood for you back in chapter 18. I, I stood for you there on Mount Carmel. I, I, I got rid of all of those false prophets. And lo and behold, Jezebel decides to come after me and kill me. But look what God says. Verse 11. And he said, this is God speaking. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. In other words, picture this in your mind's eye. Here's Elijah. He's on Mount Horeb. And God says, now I want you to stand out there. I'm going to show you something. 
And all of a sudden, this strong wind came along. The wind was so strong, it started breaking up the rocks. Okay? Verse 11 again. But the Lord was not in the wind. I mean, there was a storm coming through, but God wasn't in the wind. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. God sent three different things. A fire, an earthquake, and the wind. And Elijah kept listening for the God, listening for the Lord, listening for the Lord, listening for the Lord. You ever been in that situation where you're going through a, a time in your life, a storm in your life, and you're trying to hear God say something? But there's so much noise of the world and so much things going on in the world, you can't hear a thing in the world of what's going to happen, what's going on. But look what God said, verse 12. And after the earthquake, a fire, and the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. You know what the still, small voice means? A whisper. God whispered to him. You know what you have to do in order to hear a whisper. You get away from all the noise and the racket of the world. If you're not willing to get away from all the noise and the racket and all the world's got to throw at you, sometimes you're not going to hear what it is that God's got to say to you. If you stay in this world and you're comfortable in this world and you're comfortable with all that's going on around you, you may not be able to hear what God's got to say to you. So let me give you the second thing. Not only the work of faith is to hear the voice of God in the midst of the noise and the voices of the world. The second thing is the work of faith is to obey the voice of God however contrary to human reason it may seem. Again, go back to Genesis chapter 6. Look at verses 14 and 15. This is what God told, <laughs> told Noah to do. Now, you have to understand, when God told Noah to build the ark, it had never rained, okay? When God told Noah to build the ark, the ark was built in a, in a place where there was no water, okay? And this is what he told him to do. Genesis 6, 14, make thee... An ark of gopher wood. You say, what is gopher wood? I don't have a clue. I guess it's wood that gophers make. I'm not sure. I, don't. I, I tried to do a little study on that, and uh, they, nobody knows. You know, they, they think that it might be... Uh, anybody remember what it was up there in, in, in Kentucky? Ken, you remember? What? Cypress, that's what it was, Cypress, Cypress. So they think it was Cypress. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without. Now, there's an interesting thing about the word pitch, which, which is kind of like tar, you know, that kind of stuff. The word pitch in the Hebrew is the same word where we get the word atonement. So he's talking about atonement, but that's, that's another message, okay? Verse 15. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Now, the best that they can figure, and they took Hebrew cubits, they took Egyptian cubits and all that kind of stuff, According to that, it figured out about 550 feet long. That's a long way, okay? Uh, th that's how big the, sh the ship. It's 91 feet wide and 55 feet high. And if you ever go to that ark, you'll understand that, you know. 
But who could imagine in those days a flood could take place in a need of an ark or a ship or whatever you want to call it during those days? Surely Noah misunderstood what God was saying. And finally, Noah knew that God had said what he thought he said. Build an ark. You know, what a work of faith. God sometimes will ask you and God sometimes will ask us to do a work of faith that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And what God told Noah to do was contrary to human reasoning. just didn't make any sense. If you look at chapter 6 in Genesis verse 22, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And I have no doubt that the people in the community thought Noah and Noah's family were known as the local loonies. Here they were building this ark. When we're committed to Christ, listen to me, guys. When you and I learn to walk and work by faith and to do the things that God asks us to do, people are going to look at you and I as local loonies also. So many believers work so hard. You know, I'm amazed in all honesty, and I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm, I'm really not. I'm amazed sometimes to me it seems that Christians work hard at becoming like the world that they're in, to conform to the world, to be like the world, to, to play footsie with the world, to be accepted by the world. I'll do anything to be accepted by the world. You know, guys, if you and I ever choose and make a decision, a mandate, I'm going to please Christ with the life I live, it'll cost you something. You won't be the most popular in school. You won't be the, be the most beloved and the list could go on and on as far as that's concerned. I have no doubt in my mind that the that, that, that Jews in the days of Christ also called him crazy. As a matter of fact, there's a verse in John chapter 10, verse 20. And many of them said, he hath the devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? They thought Christ was crazy. Let me give you the third thing. We may have to quit on this one. The work of faith is to do the will of God even though you appear to be the only one doing it. The work of faith is to do the will of God even though you appear to be the only one doing it. You may be the only believer in your home. You may be the only believer in your home that takes a stand that maybe owns a Bible. You may be the only believer in your home that sits down and reads the Bible or prays. You may be the only one on your job situation that bows your head and thanks God for the meal that you have. You may be the only one, you know, in the carpool. You may be the only athlete at your school that takes a stand for God. You may be the only one. Noah was the only one at first. And evidently, somewhere along the line, Noah's influence on Miss Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives made a difference in their lives. So there was eight total that was able to go into the ark and be saved. You know, listen carefully. When, when Satan whispers in your ear, you are mistaken in standing for Christ alone. Remember, it's the work of faith for you and I to look at Satan and say, go to hell. It's left up to you and I to say, go on back where you belong. Leave me alone. I've decided in my life to walk for Christ and to work for Christ. Remember, it doesn't matter what others are doing or not doing. We answer for us and not for them. I thought about John the Baptist was having a real struggle trying to understand his circumstances when he was in jail. Uh, look, if you will, at um, Matthew chapter 11 for just a second. 
Matthew chapter 11. Now, you, you got to keep in perspective, John, John the Baptist had bapti been baptizing people. He baptized Christ. He looked at Christ one time there on the Jordan. He says, Behold the Lamb of God. I mean, everything seemed to be going as far as John was concerned, the way things ought to be going. He was the first cousin to Jesus, and he knew him well. He says in Matthew chapter 11, look what he says in the beginning of verse 2. And John's in prison. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, and he said unto him, are thou he that should come, or do we look for another? John was simply saying, now wait a minute. I know that the promised Messiah is coming, and I was convinced as I could be that you're it. But are we to be looking for another one? Is there somebody, am I missing something here? Verse 3. And he said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. And here's the kicker. Because nowhere in Scripture, other than, other than through Christ, were the blind made to see. These trickers, these people that tried to trick, they could do a lot of things, but they could not make the blind to see. And this was an Old Testament prophecy. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who shall not be offended in me. In other words, Christ was, was convincing them that he was who he was because of what he did for Christ. I want you to turn to one last scripture, and I'm going to stop. I, uh, I got too much to try to squeeze in the last few minutes. I want you to go to the book of James. I know I have 13 minutes left, but if I start on that, we'll be here a little bit longer. James chapter 2. Look, if you would, at verse 20. Everything about this little series is about faith, about trusting God, about believing God, about believing the Word of God and what it has to say. And the faith that the Word of God talks about is the faith that changes your life and my life. He says in James 2, verse 20, But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? We know, Scripture says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. But we also know that there is a, a live faith and there is a dead faith. A dead faith. A live faith, a living faith is the faith that will transform an individual's life. Verse 26, James 2. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Faith, saving faith, changes a person's life. You don't have to turn there. I just, I thought about it scripture. It's given in Matthew chapter 7. Christ was given the invitation to a message he preached, greatest message ever preached. Here's the invitation. I'm giving you the invitation. It's about faith. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And I'm not trying to change scripture. It was founded upon true saving faith. The winds blew, 
the storms came, the difficulty arose, but people, people got through what they went through because what they went through was based on faith. Verse 26, And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. Dead faith. No work. No transformation. No change. And doeth them not shall be likened to a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Living faith. Dead faith. Living faith transformed life. Dead faith, religion. Religion gets, gets you nowhere other than to hell. Nowhere. Only saving faith, transforming your life faith will save you and get you to heaven. That's the kind of faith that will make a difference. It's the kind of faith that Noah walked in. Noah worked and walked in faith, trusting and believing God. And all I'm asking you in closing is, are you working? Is your faith causing you to work for the things of God? Father, Lord, how I pray that we'll have an understanding this morning, everybody in this room, or maybe that will watch this later, that they'll understand that there does come a time in all of our lives where you offer the grace of God, just like you did in the days of Noah. For 120 years, he was faithful to preach the truth of the saving grace of God. But we know from the word of God, not other than Noah and seven people died that day and went to hell because of the rejection of the conviction of the Spirit of God. And Lord, my prayer this morning is that people in this room or maybe those later will know and recognize the fact that they have true saving faith that has changed their life, transformed their life. They don't look at life the same. They don't look at the Word of God the same. They don't look at the house of God the same. They don't look at the lost people the same. Their heart breaks because they have children and grandchildren in their lives that without Christ are going to die and go to hell. There's nothing special about walking into this room and trying to get somebody to heaven. It's all about what we do with Jesus Christ, being willing to admit that we're a sinner in need of a Savior, laying our pride aside, not caring what people think, care what you think. Lord, my prayer this morning, my plea, if there's anybody in this room that doesn't know Christ, that they'll come to me this morning and let me get them with someone that can show them from the Word of God they can be saved today. And I pray for believers here this morning that's truly born again, been saved, that they'll not give up on their loved ones, their family, They'll plead with you, beg you to show them how to be a testimony of true faith before others. We'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Let's stand.